So I'm going to go with that and uh, we'll just get started here today. Okay, so um, welcome again to the Forum in Ethics, Law, and Society. And my name is John Sullins, and I'm going to be the host and the speaker today. And I uh, hope you are all having a good um, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, or if you're homeschooled, Columbus Day. And um, so uh, there's a lot going on in the news, right? Uh, quite a lot of... Um, really difficult things happening at this particular time. And it's easy to get lost in all of that. Um, but one of the things that's sort of also happening in the news that you should be paying attention to is the rise of um, uh, generative AI. And so we have decided to do a, a little series this, uh, this um, uh, in files, uh, starting with our look at democratizing AI. Today, I'm going to look a little bit into the ethics of generative AI and maybe a little bit about how uh, generative AI works, because it's important for us to know that. And then uh, next week, uh, we will have our uh, third lecture on AI about its uh, ability to uh, spread falseness and, um, and lots, of, uh, lots of terrible things. So all of these will work together, and uh, we will... We will um, uh, by the end of this, you should be uh, somewhat of an expert on AI and its ethical impacts. So first question is, uh, what is generative AI? So currently, um, uh, we are in this uh, liminal space um, where it, just a couple of years ago, it meant one thing to be a student and an academic. And right now, we are walking through a doorway and in two or three years from now, it'll be something completely different to be a student and an academic. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the things, I spent way too much time uh, developing this, uh, this talk because I was having tons of fun using generative AI. So I asked uh, generative AI to, um, to give me a picture of a student contemplating generative AI, and uh, that's what it came up with. So, um, so this is what it thinks of itself, right? Um, and a couple things to notice, right? Um, you know, what does it think a student is? Yeah, well, what kind of kid is that? Male, right? So it's male, a certain age, right? Um, uh, young adult, right? Young adult male. There's one other student over here. It looks like just a mirror image of that of that same person, but it makes, you know, choices. It makes editorial choices about what it, uh, you know, you ask it student and it says, oh yeah, I know what a student is. That's a, that's a young man, right? Uh, probably white. And um, here you go, right? There's a student, right? So it makes these, um, these uh, distinctions uh, for you. And if you're not paying attention to it, uh, it will, it will give you so watch these as they these images I used uh, I used it to make most of the images. This image I got off of um, this is an artist that created this particular image. And I was just looking for uh, pictures of liminal spaces, and you've probably seen some of these memes out and about, and they almost always have water uh, flooding and uh, very kind of creepy and eerie. Um, so we are going to dig in now to see what's going on. We're going to go through the first door. So the first door is the door of hype. And the hype with, that we get around AI, uh, we want to ask ourselves, like, who is the salesperson and what are they trying to sell us, right? So let's take a couple, couple of looks to see. Yeah, that's as long as that cord's going to get, isn't it? Okay, so uh, first one is um, Sam Altman. And uh, he is the CEO of OpenAI. OpenAI is the one that made the big splash, right, with the uh, ChatGPT and uh, all the various iterations of ChatGPT. His company is the one that is creating those things. So, um, so he tells us this technology and society will co-evolve, right? Just like I was saying, we're going to be, we were one thing a couple of years ago, and we're going to be a, another different thing in four or five years. Uh, people will use it in different ways and for different reasons. And here he is, you know, selling us this very bright, um, uh, uh, colorful world that is coming through uh, generative AI. 
Here is another one of our uh, salespeople, SoftBank CEO, um, Masayoshi uh, Son. And uh, he's got a really interesting quote, right? He tells us in this, um, this uh, interview that was just a few days ago, he says, people who refuse to use AI will end up akin to that of goldfish, unable to process information like language, he said. The sum of knowledge that AI will command will be 10 times that of all humanity within 10 years, he added. So if you don't get on board, right? If you don't get on board with this, you will wind up being basically a goldfish, right? A goldfish in a bowl. AI may keep you, right? Just the same way we keep goldfish in bowls, right? AI may keep a few of us uh, humans around to uh, look at and study and uh, and think uh, kind thoughts of and maybe uh, give us some food once in a while. Um, but that's the future that he sees coming. And you get on board and you merge with the AI or you wind up as a goldfish. This uh, kind of hype, like I could go on, I could literally go on for the next hour just on the hype, right? So you can pick all these various people. Those are just two of my favorites. Um, and uh, this, this hype is fueling an investment um, uh, opportunity or, or, or bubble. Uh, we won't know until the bills come due. Uh, but this investment is um, uh, pouring money into uh, various machine learning models such as ChatGPT, Bing AI, Dolly, MidJourney, um, uh, tons of others, right? Uh, these are trained on vast databases of text and uh, they, they generate new text and images. And um, there are all kinds of things that you need to know, right? But the, the bottom line is um, it was uh, uh, 613 million in uh, 2022. This year, it's 2.3 billion, right? Uh, that's a lot of money, right? That's a big change. When I, I remember when, when I graduated with, uh, we were studying AI. Nobody in computer science was interested in AI, couldn't even get a job. And um, um, and it had to be stuffed into the philosophy department because it was the only, only place where they'd allow us to uh, do anything with AI. And now look at it, right? Um, we have to worry about this though. There is this thing called Gardner hype cycle. I don't know if this is like super scientific, but it's definitely something that investors think about. and. Uh, Gardner uh, produces these graphs on all kinds of um, uh, various um, uh, uh, technologies and different things. And what they do is they try to um, chart out where on this hype cycle is. So you'll notice that the technology, nobody's heard about it, then everybody's heard about it, and then everybody wishes they could forget it, and then it gets to its actual normal use, right? So, um, so this is where you're making uh, tons of money, right? This is where you're losing tons of money. And this is where you get to the realistic uh, level of uh, uh, investment return that you should be getting on this particular topic. So where is generative AI? It's right there at the top, right? Um, uh, cloud uh, computing is right just a little bit ahead of it. Uh, AI augmented software engineering is just slightly behind it. Um, look at some of this stuff that's coming down the pipe, though. Um, causal AI, right? Um, these are kind of things that you haven't uh, really heard about. Uh, cybersecurity, meta architecture, right? Um, all of this stuff is like, that's 10 years away, right? Um, but this stuff is right here with us right now. No problem. Okay, there's an an evil door, the existential dread door. So this is also a, a kind of a hype. It's like a negative hype, right? Um, AI is not only here to take your uh, jobs. It doesn't want to just be a screenwriter, right? It wants to take everything, all jobs, um, all, all of humanity with it, right? Uh, one of the uh, uh, foremost um, uh, people that uh, spends a lot of time in this area is Elon Musk. And uh, He's got a lot of existential dread, right? And is, um, uh, you know, in, in one hand, pretty happy he's making all this money. But on the other hand, 
he thinks that there's something about this technology that's going to uh, wipe out humanity uh, sometime real soon. Our buddy Sam Altman, right? He's both a promoter and a um, and a detractor of the technology that he creates. So uh, when you get him on uh, more pensive mo moments, um, he is quite uh, uh, worried about the technology that his company is creating. In fact, he was called before, well, here's, here's a quote first before we get to that. AI will probably most likely lead to the end of the world, but in the meantime, there'll be some great companies. <laughs> He meant that as kind of a joke, but only like a dark humor, right? Just like he kind of means it as well. Um, here he is being called before uh, Congress uh, on um, 516 this year. And uh, Blumenthal, Senator Blumenthal, uh, made this comment, which I think is a really interesting one we should pay attention to. Congress has a choice now. We had the same choice when we faced social media. Remember, social media was on that hype curve as well. Uh, we failed to seize that moment. The result is predators on the internet, toxic content, exploiting children, creating dangers for them. But Congress failed to meet the moment on social media. Now we have the obligation to do it on AI before the threats and risks become real. Altman said, uh, yeah, probably, right? What you should do is the US government um, might consider com combination of licensing and testing requirements. Right now, you can just make a generative AI and you can just make an app and you can unload it onto the populace. And if it does terrible things, then it just does terrible things. And you're probably not going to um, uh, have any consequences for that. You'll just you know, shut your company down and change your name to a different company. That's about all you'll, uh, that'll happen to you. Um, there are several other areas I mentioned in my written testimony where I believe that companies like ours can partner with governments, including ensuring the most powerful AI models adhere set of safety requirements. So as of today, like this, the, the last, last 48 hours, um, the uh, Elon Musk company, X, has been flooded, literally flooded, with disinformation from all sides on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And uh, there's no control, right? Uh, uh, he fired all the people that were uh, developing controls for that uh, technology. And so it's the Wild West and it is just filled with garbage. And most of that garbage is being produced by generative AI, right? So generative AI is up all day, every day, and it will pump out zillions of these messages and um, it will say whatever you want, right? You just ask generative AI, um, uh, make it sound like, you know, my side is the, uh, is the good guys in this conflict. And it will happily do that, right? And, and it'll happily do the other thing too. That's what you call a bot. That is what you call a bot. That's right, a generative AI bot. It's mixing bots and generative AI. Uh, this has been in the news, so I asked, uh, I asked Stable Diffusion to uh, give me a picture of, um, of uh, Hollywood um, uh, uh, rioting over AI, and this is what it came up with. Pretty good, uh, looks about right. Um, here's what it looked like in reality, right? So Riders Guild strike, artificial intelligence is threatening to replace skilled human labor across uh, vocations. Uh, what's more, unlike the past, when new technologies replaced activities that had to be physically performed, artificial intelligence is threading skills that we believed would remain the sole preserve of humankind. And, and here's the thing, we didn't care much when uh, um, uh, blue collar jobs were being automated. Um, people in the, in, I mean, I'm talking about us in the university, right? Very few of us paid much attention to that. Uh, but now the automation is coming literally for my job, right? And literally for the jobs you guys are training yourselves for. And now we really care, right? Now, now it's really bothering us. So that we have to keep that in the back of our mind. Uh, here's one thing that I would like to bring up. This is a, a more philosophical fear. And that is if generative AI can create as well as like a Hollywood writer, let's say. I'm not sure that's true, but let's pretend it's true. If that were to be true, then 
that means this is what it means to be a Hollywood writer, right? It means that it's a mechanical process, right? Which has, uh, you can draw it into a little flowchart. You can take this flowchart and you can turn that into code. And that code can then write Hollywood scripts, right? So that means then, right? It has this uncomfortable um, uh, philosophical uh, uh, implication, right? That creativity is not what we thought it was philosophically. There is no divine spark. There is no genius. There is no ineffable um, uh, inspiration, right? It's just this, right? And it's and this we were do our, we ourselves were doing something like this, right? And machines are now just doing it better. Just like you know, you and I can walk from here to Santa Rosa, uh, but a machine can do it better, right? A car can get you there much faster, right? So is writing exactly that same thing. Do you have a comment? I know. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And if it's a scientific process, it's a computable process. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of weird, right? Is, is all this stuff that we've been thinking is really core to being a creative, amazing human, really just something that a machine could uh, do just as well or better. Okay, so what are the most realistic outcomes? Um, darn it, I added two images to this this morning and they don't look like they came up. So sorry about that. Um, I'll talk about them here in a minute. You'll just have to imagine them. So what is this technology? Uh, uh, this will take me about two more weeks. Um, so I can't really get into the details of it, but I can point you to um, some articles. So the, this, these slides will be up in the, um, in the uh, 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 classroom site, and you'll be able to hit these links. These are live links, and they'll take you to um, this really fantastic article in the Financial Times, which gives you kind of a step-by-step -step look at how uh, this technology works in a, um, a pretty easy, you know, to understand, you know, all you need to be is sort of high school educated, you can understand that. Uh, Stephen Wolfram has also uh, produced a really great article, what is ChatGP doing and why does it work? This is a fantastic article. You need to know a little bit more math to uh, make some sense of it. But that's, but that at the core, right, what is ChatGPT? It's just really interesting math, right? It's, a, it's statistics, right? So, um, so some of the questions that he asks in this article that I think are worth uh, us talking about here is, can a big enough chat GPT do everything, right? So Wolfram takes the, on this philosophical thing. It can do this job, it can do that job. If, we, if chat GPT four can't do it, can five do it? Can six do it? Can eight do it? Can 20,000 chat GPT 20,000 do it, right? So um, it's iterating all the time. And the question is, at what point does it get to, um, does it ever run into any roadblocks? And he says, yes, actually it does. There are some things that are computationally irreducible, right? And we've known these for a long time. In fact, I did my, um, my uh, uh, PhD on, on uh, some of this stuff, right? So uh, cellular autom automata are uh, really interesting uh, little uh, uh, kinds of computers and uh, they are basically, um, the idea in a cellular automaton is um, uh, you're given a very simple formula and then that formula gets, um, gets uh, um, seeded with some data and then that data computes on itself with no human input and produces these uh, big uh, um, massive, uh, grids of cells and the cells turn on and off and uh, they can be different colors and all kinds of stuff like that. You can make uh, all kinds of fun uh, graphics with these things. But here's the thing about a cellular automaton is that um, if, even if you're given the formula and you're given the initial data, you cannot predict what the cellular automaton is gonna look like in a thousand steps. You can't jump ahead right? You, you have to actually compute each thousand steps to get the, the, the result. Now, it's all deterministic, of course, but it's not predictable. It's deterministic, but not predictable. So 
there are a lot of things that um, that we are interested in in the world that turn out to to not be something that the computer can just jump to the uh, conclusion. It it would it basically it just would not have any more. Um, uh, it wouldn't be any faster at it than like we would, right? Uh, another thing that he talks about is uh, oh, and this is it. The more the more computationally irreducible a problem is, the less trainable the uh, computer is in that problem. So we have to look at what are these issues? What are these things that are uh, uh, irreducibly computational? Uh, there's embeddings. Uh, transformers encode words as numbers and tokens. They don't deal with words as words. You deal with words as words. Um, the machine does not deal with words as words. It encodes them into numbers. Um, it does not know any language, even though it can speak every language. Yeah, yeah, I know you don't. So um, uh, this is what causes, um, so, the, so these embeddings, right? It makes guesses. This is the thing that bothers Wolfram the most. The, the chat GPT type uh, uh, AI has to make guesses. We call these things hallucinations. Um, the way it's trained and currently used makes it just a mirror of the conventional language and wisdom. Right, so it's all ChatGPT is is just a it's just a look at what most people think. Right, so like for instance, when um, when uh, you ask it uh, to draw a picture of a fast food worker, it's it will give you what most people think a fast food worker looks like. Um, it won't. It doesn't go out and survey like and and get all the data. Um, who are all the fast food workers? What do they look like, right? Because if it did, um, it would produce a, uh, a Caucasian looking uh, a clerk because most fast food workers are Caucasian. But what it produces is uh, somebody of uh, various ethnicities, right? Because that's what we think uh, fast food workers are. It's not the reality, it's what we think. And so that's not science, right? That's not science at all. So chat GPT might not be the greatest thing for doing science. Okay, oh, here's, here's my little uh, things when they're talking about creativity. So check out some of these uh, problems, right? How many N's in the uh, word mayonnaise? Anybody in here guess? There's two, right? There's two. Uh, this particular AI chatbot says, oh, there's four, right? And so then you, the human asks, well, four, list them, right? And it says here, here's one, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one, right? It's just making stuff up, right? Making up words, right? That's how it thinks, right? Um, there are, you ask it, uh, what are, uh, a country in Africa that starts with the letter K, and it says, there are 54 recognized countries in Africa. None of them begin with the letter K. The closest is Kenya. <laughs> which starts with a K sound, but is actually spelled with a K sound. It's always interesting to learn trivia and facts like this. <laughs> so it can't, it can't even self-check, right? Can't even self-check. So there's some real problems with this. I had it, um, uh, maybe I think a couple of you are in my other class, but recently I, ha I just asked it to solve the Tower of Hanoi problem. And uh, and tell me, you know, how many steps for a five disc, and that that should be like sixteen moves, right? And so it says, oh, I can do it in four, and it 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 looked like like it was telling me things that sounded like the problem, but if you if you actually move the disc yourself, right, it it came nowhere near to solving the uh, the the uh, question. It just at the end it said, and I've solved it, right? But no, you haven't, right? No, you haven't. I asked it to do it again and it got in a loop and it was like into a hundred steps and it was still, and then it just stopped. <laughs> this is something that um, I could have any of you in this class, even if you don't know the problem, you'd solve it really quickly. Okay, so this brings us to our friend, uh, Lady Loveless, who uh, makes this objection, right? Uh, she was uh, one of the very first computer programmers. Of course, she was not programming on a digital computer. She was using a difference engine, analytical engine that looked like that in, uh, in her day. Um, but uh, but she, so, she tells us basically, right, 
the, the analytical engine, and that's a com computer, right? It's the same as any other computer, it's just slow and uh, generates a lot of heat. Um, analytical engine has no pretensions, whatever, to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power anticipating any relations or truths. Its province is to assist us in making available what we already what we are already acquainted with. Um, so she said, you know, these things can't be creative. So I asked it, you know, uh, two days ago to draw a picture of Lady Lovelace. I don't know. What do you think? It's close. It's interesting, right? This portrait has never existed on this planet until I asked it to draw it, right? This one's well known. This one's been around for centuries, right? Um, it's not a direct copy. Do you notice that? It's not It's not just like, oh, that's Lady Lovelace. You want a portrait? Here's one done by this guy, you know, in, in uh, 18 whatever, right? No, this is brand new. And they put her in like uh, almost Renaissance clothes, right? She she was not in that from that era. Um, so they're taking artistic license. But my question is, would Lady Lovelace have to say, this is a new creation if she was here to, to look at it? Okay, let's look at this. Um, so this is uh, August 25th, just this year. They took 24 graduate students. Um, they had them uh, take a test of creativity, a well-known test, the TTCT, right? And um, uh, it turned out that ChatGPT4 placed in, uh, they took it eight times, and, um, um, and also the, the students took it. And uh, turned out that it was in the top 1%, right? So if you, if you test it, on the same test, like I could, I could give you this test, see how creative you are, how creative you are, and how creative you are, right? We get a little number, right? ChatGPT will beat all of us in the room, right? Every last one of us. Okay, so that's, a, that's considered a scientific test of creativity, right? So that means uh, ChatGPT scored top 1%. Um, so that means that, you know, if you want the most creative screenwriter, who do you hire? This chat GPT, right, is going to be your best bet. It's going to be the most creative screenwriter you've ever had. My question is, uh, as a philosopher, is this test actually a good test, right? So I would, I would want to ask that, right? Uh, to me, the fact that ChatGPT can pass it in the top 1% uh, probably is not evidence that ChatGPT is creative. It's more, it's uh, more likely evidence that this uh, test is garbage. Okay, um, the, our friends at Stanford, uh, uh, Ting An and, and her colleagues um, have, um, uh, have started this uh, investigation into human human and AI creativity. Uh, they've come up with uh, four themes. They haven't done a lot of science yet in this area, but you can see the kind of things that they're that they're looking at. And uh, all of these are really big and important problems. Okay, so quick overview, right? Um, the hypes and fears, AI and society will co-evolve, uh, don't be a goldfish, money, 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 and uh, oh, we might also destroy the world. Uh, consumer realities, interesting cool tools that are free-ish for now. Uh, creative fields and academics are being disrupted. Uh, CEOs will get rich, but how about you? Will you get rich, right? Well, what's this gonna do to you? That's what I want you to think about. It's gonna be great for Sam Altman. Is it gonna be great for you? Okay, just uh, real quick. Um, so here, here um, uh, um, is uh, uh, this time I asked I, I asked a stable diffusion to make sure that um, um, that we didn't get a you know I, I gave it a negative prompt no no white guys so gave me somebody that looks sort of vaguely Asian this time. Um, using a computer, using in a, in a I asked it to uh, talk about uh, 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 using a computer within a uh, mirror maze, and that's what it came up with. 
I would like you to think about this really interesting philosophical concept. And uh, uh, Levinson came up with this in 77 in this article, Toy, Mirror, and Art. And um, uh, I can give you the, uh, the quick rundown of this argument. He talks about how new technologies, when they're used, they begin as a toy. Um, then we use them to mirror our reality. And then after that, we actually discover what they can do um, in and of themselves. And that's where the, where the world changing happens, right? So currently, I think that uh, uh, ChatGPT is, has, is just leaving the toy stage. And right now we're using it to mirror, like we ask it to uh, pretend it's a uh, college student writing a, uh, an essay for an English class. So we're using it to mirror our reality. And uh, the next step, of course, is when, when we use it, when we start realizing it has other uses that are uh, far beyond what we can imagine with our world that we're in right now. Okay, so here are some of the things that it's currently being used for in the mirror stage. Uh, grading student essays, you can turn an essay into me, I can plop it into chat GPT and I can say, if you were a teacher, how would you grade this? And it will grade it, like it will grade it pretty well, right? And um, then I can just copy and paste that and send it right back to you, right? That's one way I can use it. Um, another way is we can use it a little more intentionally and have, um, have it uh, be a tutor, right, as you're writing. So you write with ChatGPT and um, it can help you uh, write that way. Um, it's bringing out a new era of movie magic. So uh, all this generative AI can uh, gives each one of you in the room the power to uh, create special effects that used to take a whole um, uh, army of technicians to produce and you can do it now. So you could just make a movie in your movie class that's uh, almost the same as a, uh, as a, um, uh, you know, a big AAA picture in the, uh, in the 90s. Um, AI is uh, moving down to every business. Not, it's not just for big corporations anymore. It's affordable. Uh, it can also be used um, if, you know, very carefully uh, for science and research. So perhaps we're just making AI available to many more people. Um, I'm going to skip these examples here and uh, walk us over here, I think. Try this. Oops, oops, oops. That's not going to let me. I'm not going to. I'm not going to spend much time on these, but um, some I, I will in the in the talk I'm giving in another couple of weeks, not in here, but in the for the faculty. Okay, let's talk a little bit about AI ethics. And um, in AI ethics. Uh, so I asked it to, um, I asked Stable Diffusion to give me a picture of AI ethics, and this is what it came up with. Um, so what are the principles of responsible use for this kind of technology, right? So first thing we have to worry about is bias. Uh, there's a lot of bias in generative AI. Uh, user bias influences the response. So how you ask the question will dictate the kind of answers that it gives you. Um, we need to uh, take this technology and figure out how to make less biased. Uh, uh, actually, we need to train you, right? This is something that the college can do, is train you to make less biased uh, prompts. Um, AI mirrors culture, like uh, Levinson taught us. So uh, different cultures get different results out of the same technology. Uh, it has algorithmic bias. Uh, so we have to include uh, diverse views in the design Otherwise, we're going to get uh, inequitable results out of, um, out of this uh, technology. And uh, training uh, data bias as well. AI can only produce to the status quo. And we feed it the status quo. So it's always going to come in in the middle, right? It's not going to challenge our views. It's just going to uh, reflect um, our, our most common views. The environment. So, um, so I, I asked uh, Stable Diffusion to tell me what AI sustainability looks like, and that's what it came up with. You can see the kind of weird little graph stuff it's going around the end. I guess that's the AI. AI is going to protect the world in a in a bubble and uh, rearrange all the continents as well. 
So, um, so uh, training uh, attempts to reduce this, um, pr reduce the carbon footprint. So uh, training these models currently takes a lot of power. I do want to draw your attention to this article that just came out a couple days ago. And uh, this challenges that and, and says that actually um, humans require more energy to learn than, uh, than generative AI does. This is controversial. Um, yeah, there, currently, there's a big argument about this, but basically, um, the question is like, uh, um, you know, how did how did you learn to speak? Right, you learned to speak as a as a child, and you heard, you know, a few uh, few ten thousand words, right, and then suddenly you started talking. Um, uh, for a Chat GPT, um, it 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 has to have millions and millions and millions of words. And uh, that it has to be uh, uh, embedded in before it can start to say anything coherent. So obviously, you know, it seems like it's, it's reasonable to stay, say, state that um, that uh, comp computers take a lot more energy to learn things that uh, that we learn with uh, uh, less energy. Um, uh, cultural sustainability. This is a really important one. Remember. ChatGPT spits out homogenized data, right? And that homogenized data will, over time, like it is transforming our culture. Altman is right about that. But we may not like where it's taking us. It's going to take us into a more homogenous culture where the interesting things out on the fringes um, don't really happen anymore. We're all we're all sort of in the middle with um, with the most uh, uh, common outcomes. Uh, rare earth minerals, right? We got to, we, our computers currently use a lot of these things and they're hard to get and they're in strange places and there's only so many of them on the planet and um, all the terrible things that we do with mining um, are happening with this technology as well. Fair use, I think is really an important one. I uh, Again, I could spend a weeks on this, <clears throat> but, just a quick example, right? You read a, chi a children's book to a, a child, that's fair use. The book is read at a library to a group of children, that's fair use. You play to a child a file you bought off of, a, of an actor reading the book, that's fair use. You ask an AI to read the book word for word, probably not fair use. That's probably actually illegal, right? Um, are people going to be doing this? Yes, they are already doing this, right? So, um, so uh, generative AI plays fast and loose with uh, with fair use. And then everybody's favorite here at the university, plagiarism. So, um, uh, here's some ideas for you as students trying to uh, navigate this minefield, right? Uh, use use it for initial draft, but review and edit it yourself. Be sure to add your own creativity. Certainly just asking Ch ChatGBT to write your essay and then cutting and pasting that, that's plagiarism. But if you use it as a tool, maybe it's not, right? Uh, make sure you, uh, I don't know how um, I spelled that, but I did spell it that way. I, I, I cut and paste it from ChatGPT, I'm gonna blame that. So um, acknowledge your collaboration with AI services, um, find academic guidelines and adhere to them. Um, this is a nice little article on it. As SSU, we currently don't have official guidelines, but we will by probably the end of the year. Uh, so stay educated on the development of those guidelines. Okay, so what are some things that you can do as a student faced with this, right? One pretty smart thing that you should probably already be doing is learning prompt engineering. Uh, you can take uh, this, these classes. Um, they're available everywhere online right now. They are a pretty good idea. Uh, for instance, Anthropic advised uh, uh, $375,000 per year for a, a trained um, a prompt engineer, right? Here's the good news. If you're a philosophy graduate, philosophy graduates are great at prompt engineering. You don't need to know any computer science beyond just the English language and how to ask logical questions, like you already know Boolean algebra because you because that's the thing that we teach you. 
uh, in in our major. So you're ready to take the lead, right, on these on these jobs, right? So go go out there and get them, right? Um, unfortunately, it's a double-edged sword. The smarter you get at prompt engineering, the the easier it is for you to bypass the uh, safety guardrails that they put into chat GPT-4. So I think you saw over the weekend, right, um, they were using the Bing in image generator to make all these really terrible images like uh, um, SpongeBob flying an airplane into the Twin Towers. And um, that was the most calm of all of them, right? And they're, they're, they broke it. They broke uh, Bing image generator over the weekend and then they flooded 4chan with all these uh, nasty, nasty images, right? So um, the cleverer you are, right? If you can be more clever than the, than the engineers at the companies, then you can make these things do terrible things. Okay, um, in writing, right? So we've got the library has a, a detail, a somewhat detailed guide on using this. Um, this one I like a lot, right? So this one is from North Carolina and uh, generative AI and epidemic writing. It's really complete and uh, uh, tells you how to use it for brainstorming, for outlines. Um, I've used it for slides. I just take like somebody wants me to give a talk on a paper, right? I've taken my paper, I put it into chat GPT and I say, I, I need a, a you know 40 minute talk on uh, off of this paper and it just zip gives me all the slides, right? It does they're not the, it doesn't give me like well crafted slides. I have to craft them after that, but it takes a whole bunch of my time. Um, it saves a whole bunch of my time, right? And it's all my work and it's just uh, spitting back my work. So uh, that that's perfectly fine. Um, experiment with different modes or styles. You can try something if you've written, have it try uh, it out in different modes and styles. You can write, maybe you're the kind of person who writes very colloquially, but you've got to make this formal. You could take that piece of writing, put it into chat GPT and make it uh, come out formal, right? Uh, summaries and abstracts, it's really great at. Um, you got to remember the text is simplistic. It has zero grammar errors, right? Uh, and spelling errors. Uh, that's one nice thing about it, but it won't, it'll give you status quo stuff. It'll get you a B, it won't get you an A. Um, it's great at translating stuff from one language to another. Uh, it's great at uh, taking your angry email and turning it polite. So um, if you're angry at your group, you bastards, we've got, we've got a due date and you've been a bunch of jerks. And then you put it in chat GPT and say, make this polite. And it says, dear colleagues, we are under a deadline, right? So it's really useful for that. Um, here I had it, I had it draw a hallucination. So I guess this is what stable diffusion thinks a AI hallucination looks like. Um, you gotta be aware of AI hallucinations. It will, um, if we, if we had had the time to dig into the Wolfram article, the way we should have, right. You will see that the, because of the way the statistics work, it has to guess at there are certain points when it, it runs up against, uh, uh, roadblocks, it has to guess. So it makes stuff up, right? It makes up citations. It confidently lies to you. Um, it does not learn from your use. It is filled with bias. Um, make sure your instructor knows you're using it. And if they prohibit it, do not use it, right? Uh, your information is not private. They may be collecting your information, right? Why, why is it free? Nothing is free. It's free because you're, you're training its algorithm. You're the product, right? Um, it can completely change what you were trying to say. Like without you knowing, it can nudge you into saying something other than what you had intended to say at the beginning. This is what I'm really worried about. I do a lot of my work in AI nudging and, um, and I'm, I'm really interested in how the computer can nudge you to be more ethical or nudge you to be less ethical. Um, subtly and without your knowledge of it doing it. <clears throat> so that's my other work. Okay, so here's some other ideas as we uh, come to the end here. Uh, so just a couple of things that I grabbed, you know, serendipitously off the web. Uh, you can take uh, just some crummy picture that you have on your phone and have it uh, doll it up, right? So you need a, you need a headshot for, uh, for something professional then you just change it into something professional, right? 
Um, Getty Images in this article is now coming up with a way to actually pay the artists whose work is used to train AI, which is great news because Getty Images is the biggest image um, uh, repository in the world. And uh, they're going to be making micropayments. So if one of your images winds up on uh, Getty Images and it's used to train AI, you'll get like 12 cents. That'd be great. Okay, so um, uh, we can use it for programming, you know, ups and downs, right? Ups and downs with the programming. Um, uh, we can use it for text to speech, uh, gaming. And then this one, I want you guys to try this one. There's this new app called Tome. I, I only found out about it this weekend, otherwise I would have used it for this presentation, but it just asks you questions and it produces these presentations, right? So it'll produce all the graphics, lay out all the slides, right? And you don't have to have any clue what you wanted to talk about but when you started Start Tome. Like with this, with Prezi, PowerPoint, Google Slides, like you have to know what you're gonna say and then you, then you turn it into that format. With Tome, you just walk into it and uh, it just asks you questions and answers and out comes a, a really high quality uh, professional looking uh, presentation, right? So when I ask you to do a presentation and uh, you forget about it, and then, um, then it's like, uh, like our class is on Monday and it's Sunday, uh, well, it's actually Monday morning, 2 a.m. And you go, holy shit, I have to give a, a presentation at uh, 10 a.m. Um, then, you know, there's your friend, right? And the uh, AI will come to your rescue. But remember, it's gonna be filled with bias and um, lies and, um, and, uh, and, and, we'll, and we'll just give you the status quo, right? And is incapable of science as we, um, as we uh, talked about earlier in this talk. Okay, so that gives us, um, takes us to the end. So uh, this last one, I'll just draw your attention to this. this, this I asked it to do uh, talk about people joining the AI party. And here's what it came up. There's money all over the table. Um, but if you, if you zoomed in, if this screen was any better, you could see each one of these people look super creepy. They are way down the uncanny valley. Um, so that's what it's gonna do to you, right? It's gonna take you, an actual person, it's gonna give you crap tons of money and it's gonna turn you into an uncanny valley robot, right? All right, that's all I have to say. See you guys next time.